Imperial Uncle. Chapter 9. The next day, I go to the palace to relate the punishment of Princess Hawaii to His Majesty and the Dowager Empress. I was going to see Kijhi first, but a young court eunuch told me that His Majesty was in the study having a meeting, so I changed course to see the Dowager Empress instead. The Dowager Empress listens to how I will punish Princess Hawaii without interruption. A long time passes before she sighs, and with eyes half closed says to me, when this one made that match for you, it was because I thought Li Yu was an upstanding man, so surely his daughter must have been attentively brought up she had to be a well-bred young lady. At the time, Wang Qin and Yun Tang entrusted me with their wish to marry a daughter to you. I deliberated among these three young women, Wang Qin's daughter was also a proper young lady, but she wasn't as pretty as this one from Li Yu's family. With your manners and your looks, only a beauty could be worthy of you. Yun Tang's daughter had the looks, but I heard that she did not have a good temper. Even young Yun Yu with his smart mouth was afraid of his older sister at home. Besides, Yun Tang is His Majesty's grand tutor, you two qualify as peers, if his daughter married you, wouldn't it mix up the hierarchy? That's why, after all the sifting through, I chose Li Yu's daughter. Who'd have thought she'd turn out like this? I have actually been mistaken. From my lower seat I smile, apologetic. How could it ever be your fault? Most of the fault for Princess Consort Hawaii's actions lies with me. The Dowager Empress's eyes snap open. Nonsense. How could it be your fault? Wasn't she already intimate with that guard when she was at her parents' house? Li Yu was a devoted official in the government. How could he have been such a fool at home to have a daughter like that? Lord Li was busy with matters of governance. It's understandable for him to have neglected domestic affairs. Also, when Princess Consort Hawaii was living with her parents, she was brought up in the innermost court of the house it may be crude to say so, but which young woman doesn't yearn for love? She was little then, didn't know any better, read a few poems about poor scholars and the noble women who found their happy endings, met a young man and secretly gave him her heart. This story was never anything out of the ordinary, and I'm sure she never crossed the line then. Once she was married, she'd be able to forget about the whole thing. But as it happened, once she married into my family, pausing, I hang my head and sigh, I neglected her, that's why she. I don't really blame her. The Dowager Empress takes out a handkerchief and wipes the corner of her eyes. Oh, Prince Hui, listening to you, it's making me feel so sad. Princess Consort Hawaii is just not meant to be blessed with such good fortune you're generous, tolerant, and so considerate too. And towards women you're, why did it, how about this, I'll make another match for you, and make sure to find you someone wonderful. I have a younger cousin from my parents' family, she's like you, not old but holds a high position in the family hierarchy, 17 this year and not yet betrothed. That child mostly grew up right before my eyes, she's well behaved and smart, just maybe a bit shy. Her zodiac is compatible with yours too. Why don't I get someone to bring a portrait to your house tomorrow? You can take a look. In my heart, I lament, the Dowager Empress's guard against me really doesn't ever let up a smidgen. All these years I've been married to Princess Hawaii, the Dowager Empress has always sent for her too three times a month for a visit at the palace. And now Princess Hawaii has just joined a Buddhist nunnery, and here she is trying to foist her younger cousin on me. I deliberately remain silent for some time before replying. If your cousin is willing to marry me, it would be a great privilege, but you know of certain tendencies of mine that are difficult to talk about. For any young lady, marrying me would serve only to spoil her chances of a good life. The Empress perseveres. This one believe, Prince Hawaii, that your predilections are merely an extension of not confining yourself to the rights, a shortcoming of youth. There's no need for you to worry, that cousin of mine is both dutiful and gentle, she would never get jealous. No matter how unrestrained you may be outside the home, you'd still need a woman at home to maintain the place, help you manage things. Some things are better done by women. 
Prince Y, you're an only child, and at your age, you really must consider having an heir. This little bit of self-interest of hers is calculated so loudly I can hear the bead snapping in an abacus marrying her cousin to me means she can surveil me day and night, and give me children as well, so that in the future her parents' family will also have a hand in my estate. Very well. Thank you for your concern, seems I've given you a lot of trouble again. The Dowager Empress's strongest suit is perseverance. Even if I keep putting her off, she'll just chip away at me ceaselessly so I never have any peace. I may as well give her a perfunctory response and worry about it later. As I thought, after I said that, her expression clears up once more. She proceeds to give me a pile of details about her little cousin, and I'm only able to slip away after about an hour. By the time I make it to the imperial study again, Kichi is already finished with his meeting. A young court eunuch takes me inside. The moment Kichi sees me, the first thing he says to me is, Imperial uncle, you really are as decisive as a storm, to have settled the entire affair by yesterday morning. It could hardly be called settled. This servant merely found a quiet way to hush things up that could at least salvage some of this servant's reputation. The Dowage Empress is indeed showing great solicitude for the servant she was just talking about making the servant another match, betrothing one of your majesty's cousin aunts to the servant. Kijhi's expression freezes. You accepted. This servant sidestepped. This servant told her this defect of mine is incorrigible, that I would only be holding up the girl's life to no purpose. But it's hard to decline the Dowager Empress's kindness, so I... Kijhi stares at me sidelong, the corners of his mouth slightly lifting. Oh, so you've come to us to file a suit against Imperial Mother. Did you want us to decline the match for you? The wispy curl at the corner of his mouth speaks volumes. You're actually very much relieved that Princess Consort Hawaii has gone to a Buddhist nunnery, aren't you? I remain silent. Kijhi walks around his desk and sits down behind it. Taking out a brush from the brush pot, he turns it over and over in his hand. I could go speak to mother, but how will you thank us? I bow. Your majesty shows the servant great favor, your imperial grace is boundless, this servant is moved to tears. Kijhi taps his chin lightly with the heel of his brush. That's all? You're so stingy. Rather uncomfortably, I reply. It's not as though the servant can just casually take your majesty to dinner, and lately Kitten's been borrowing so much the servant is nearly broke. There are no wonderful items that the servant could offer your majesty either. Kijhi spins the brush. Day before last, we saw a set of peach stone carvings of the eight immortals at banquet in your main hall. It was very unique, quite amusing. Heavens, this emperor nephew of mine sure has sharp eyes. He was surrounded by layers of eunuchs that day, yet he somehow managed to spot such a tiny little thing. Your Majesty, what good eyesight you have. This servant could never have procured such a clever little item myself. It was a gift. What, can you not bear to part with it, Imperial Uncle? It couldn't have been a gift from your lover, could it? As soon as I hear the word Imperial Uncle I know that all is not well. I hasten to say, not in the least. This servant will have it wrapped up properly and delivered to your majesty as soon as the servant get back. Only then does Kijhi beam at me with satisfaction. A little while later, I take my leave. I've already turned around when Kijhi's voice calls me again. Chinjun. I turn my head. Kijhi leans back in his chair, watching me. Don't worry. As long as we are here, we will not let a new princess consort cross your threshold. Again, I bow. Thank you, your majesty. Emerging from the imperial study, I walk slowly along the path. I don't know why, but the way Kijhi said Chinjun just now is making me feel strangely sentimental. I remember that the first time Kijhi called me Chinjun was the first day he held court as an emperor come of age. It was also his 15th birthday, and I came to the palace with a jade scepter to congratulate him. It was a formal occasion, 
and all the courtesies were observed to the utmost. After I knelt down for a kowtow, I heard Kijhi say, Chinjun, please rise. A multitude of officials were congregated in the Hall of Supreme Harmony, after those words left his mouth, a sudden hush fell across the hall. I looked up, but only just, I was momentarily startled. For a little while, all was quiet. Thereupon the Dowager Empress, who had been seated to the side, stood up. Your Majesty, how could you address Prince Hwaiso? He is Your Majesty's uncle. Under no circumstances should one address one's elders by name. Kijhi pursed his lips silently, a pair of glittering eyes staring right at me. Hurriedly, I smiled. No need for such heavy words, Your Highness. His Majesty addressing the servant in this way is a display of intimate favor towards the servant. While it is true that the servant is His Majesty's uncle, before that, this servant is His Majesty's subject. If His Majesty is willing to call me by name, this servant should rather thank His Majesty for showing me such favor. Again I kowtowed. Thank you, Your Majesty. As I got up, I saw that Kijhi was still looking at me, but there was a hint of a smile at his lips. End chapter Imperial Uncle Chapter 10 Ever since that day, the way Kijhi addresses me has gotten all mixed up. Imperial Uncle, Prince Hwai, Chinjun it all depends on what he feels like using. I'm not particular about what I'm called, and anyway he's the emperor, so one must let him have his way. Ever since that day it was like Kijhi became another person, too. Before, he was a quiet child that didn't make a sound, and seemed a bit weak. But once he started independently holding court, he changed day by day, like someone reborn. Kijhi was made heir apparent from the day he was born, his upbringing wasn't like the other princes. He didn't leave the palace often. Among this generation of emperor's sons and prince's sons, he and I were the least close. We were not close until that one year, I recall that he was maybe nine or ten then. The former emperor was still around, and my mother was still alive. It was her birthday, not long after the end of the spring festival. Kitten, Kife, and the other sons of the emperor all came to my estate to play, taken along by their concubine mothers. Kilai and Kixian, and other sons of princes, as well as Yun Yu, Wang Xian, and other such children of major court figures also came along with their parents. The Empress was an unexpected guest and she even took the heir apparent Kijhi along, my mother, the birthday lady, found herself overwhelmed just attending to all these important guests. Children as a rule did not enjoy eating at a banquet, so they all went off to play in the back gardens. It was snowing fine powdery snow, and the pile of children ran to and fro piling it into mounds and rolling snowballs, while their attendants looked on, shaking in their boots with trepidation. Kijhi was the only one sitting in the middle of the gallery, wrapped in a fur coat, watching the others play. Since he was the heir apparent who would someday be an emperor, all the other children had been given instructions by the adults, and didn't dare play with him like that. If they smacked into or scratched his future majesty, it could be something he still remembered once he ascended to the throne. So, Kijhi had nothing to do but sit there. His hand-warming stove, seating mat, back cushion, and even his teacups were brought specially from the palace. A host of eunuchs young and old waited on him while he sat there motionless like a baby doll. I was standing in the gallery as well, making sure the kids didn't fall and hurt themselves, ready to help if anything should happen. I saw the old eunuch give a cup of tea to the little heir apparent, using a small woolen handkerchief to cushion the cup. The little heir apparent placed his hand-warming stove on his knees, lifting his little hands up to take the cup from the eunuch all prim and proper. He took little sips from his tea cup, I could not help wanting to laugh, watching him. Perhaps sensing that I was looking at him, Kijhi turned his shiny black eyes on me, then immediately looked down and away again. I thought, the empress has taken a prince and totally made him softer than a princess. Compared to my other cousin nephews running about the courtyard like a bunch of wild rabbits, he was truly upsetting. 
As this thought was running through my mind, Kijhi turned to glance at me again. As soon as I looked back, he immediately turned away. Maybe this child didn't like strangers, felt shy around them. I was just about to try coaxing a few words out of him when a cacophony of children's voices erupted from the yard, a peal of kitten, Kilai, and the other children yammering, Imperial Uncle June, Imperial Uncle June. I hurried over, and found Kitten pointing at a tree of winter plum, telling me, Imperial Uncle June, I want flowers. I raised my hand to break off a branch, but Kitten pulled at my coat. I'll take a branch myself. So I picked him up and let him take that branch of plum blossom. After Kitten was back on the ground, Kife, Kilai, and the others who had been waiting by my knees all hollered that they wanted one too. I picked them up one by one, that's how that winter plum soon became half bald. Out of all of the emperor's sons, Kife had always been the sneakier one. Holding up his branch of winter plum, he said, mine is for royal big brother, and diligently running to the gallery, the stuffed the branch into Kichi's hands. The rest of the children also ran into the gallery, chattering. I'd forgotten which child it was that bumped into the eunuch next to Kijhi, that eunuch swayed and the entire pot of tea he'd been holding fell right onto Kijhi. There was immediate pandemonium, but fortunately the water wasn't scalding hot and Kijhi's clothes were thick. Just that half of it was now wet. The eunuchs were so scared their hands were all shaking, so I had little choice but to pick Kijhi up myself. Someone was chiding the child who caused this mess, but then to my surprise Kijhi started speaking, we are fine. Don't scold him or punish him. His tone was most calm and unperturbed. I could not help feeling astonished kids these days, truly, each more mature than the last. Kijhi's clothes were soaked through, and for the moment at least, he didn't have anything to change into. My mother and I weren't so bold as to dare dress the heir apparent in my old clothes. In the end we just had him take off the outside layer, and sat him on a bed wrapped in a blanket while we waited for someone to fetch a change of clothes from the palace. He sat on the bed, yet again quite motionless. I asked him if he wanted to have a snack, and with eyes downcast he nodded without a word. I asked again, did he want walnut shortbread or five seed cake? He glanced at the two plates, still didn't say anything, so I held up both plates in front of him. He gave the plate with the walnut shortbread a look. He only reached out from beneath the blankets once I took a piece of walnut shortbread off the plate and held it right before him, taking it from me to raise it to his mouth to take tiny bites. The old eunuch smiled, and said to me, His Highness doesn't like to talk when he's in unfamiliar places. I found it all rather upsetting. From then on, when Kitten and the others came to play in my estate, to my surprise sometimes Kijhi tagged along too. Perhaps he felt more familiar with the place after that previous visit, since he didn't bring along too large of a retinue about the same as any other emperor's son. And he was never quite so closed off as on that day either, the more he came over, the less constrained he became. But he never was talkative. When he saw me at the palace, he would give me his greetings awkwardly calling me Uncle June. Back in those days, my dad often brought home curious knickknacks while out on his military campaigns. Half the reason those princes loved visiting the Prince Hawaii estate was for the sake of these objects. Especially Kitten whenever he took a fancy to something, he'd throw all manners to the wind and had to have it, even if he had to make a scene. Kitten wasn't like that at all, he never asked for anything himself, only ever looked. Whenever he fancied something, he'd look at it constantly with an indifferent, calm sort of stare until I couldn't stand it anymore and brought the object to him to ask, do you like this? Only then would he open his mouth to reply all prim and proper, yes, if it's possible, reaching out to take it as though I was the one who begged him to accept. And that's why I often thought to myself then that though he was a bit introverted, he really did have the makings of an emperor, if based on that alone. I walk as I reminisce on these old scenes, surprisingly feeling somewhat sentimental. In a blink all my imperial nephews have grown, it feels like nothing much happened in the interim, 
but somehow the time has gone. Only once I turn to look do I realize that many years have already passed. Standing next to the palace wall, I stare at the clouds at the horizon, and cannot help speaking ruefully aloud, how could one not exclaim the years do make us old? A voice rings out behind me, Your Highness. If a moment ago I felt like an aging scholar tree looking around at the crowd of verdant and lush little trees sprouting up all around me, then after that voice rings out, all of a sudden I feel as though I'm a willow branch swaying in mid-spring breeze, leaves turning into just the right shade of green. I turn to stare, and with a voice like tender willow, I greet him, Chancellor Lu. I wait for Lu Tongyi to catch up, and we walk side by side. Just now, I thought I heard your highness speaking ruefully about the passage of time. Is it safe to say that the sight of the sunset has made you sentimental? I smile sardonically. No. It's because incidentally thinking about old times has made one feel sentimental. Lu Tongyi issues an understanding oh, and I steal a glance at his elegant features, while outwardly I remain perfectly composed. If it's someone else who said what he just said such as Yun Yu or Kit and Orki Lai then I would assume they were mocking me. But how could Lu Tongyi so casually mock me? For him to put it so, he had to have been describing some scene akin to poetry. It's just that my ears are pedestrian, therefore the way I've interpreted those words turned out equally pedestrian. But my reply can't be pedestrian, my reply ought to be just like Lu Tongyi, more poetic. So, then I stare off at the sunset that's still rather harshly dazzling to the eye, and say to him softly, Chancellor Lu, do you enjoy watching the sunset? I think of poetry every time I watch the sunset. Those verses would hang in my heart, like the red clouds of sunset hang in the sky. Lu Tongyi raises his sleeve to his mouth and coughs. I give him a moment, but do not hear a response. I ask in a rush, do you feel unwell? Would you like this prince to take you back to your estate? A little smile emerges in Lu Tongyi's expression. Oh, it's nothing this official merely choked a little just now. End chapter Imperial Uncle Chapter 11 Mayhap the sunset has indeed made me overly sentimental, all of a sudden, I ask Lu Tongyi something I thought I'd never have the courage to ask. Chancellor Lu, what do you think of me? I regret those words as soon as they have left me. What can he ever say about me? Surely he won't tell me what he really thinks to my face. Lu Tongyi gives me a look. Thankfully, he does not seem uncomfortable. As I expected, he says, Your Highness, why do you ask? I say in a rush, Oh, it doesn't matter. Perhaps it's because so many things have been happening lately, what should stay in my heart and what comes out of my mouth sometimes gets confused. If you don't want to tell me, then just pretend I didn't say anything. Your Highness, try not to take things to heart. This too shall pass. Just like that, he softly sidesteps the question I raised earlier. I get a strange little twinge in my heart after hearing it, he evaded the question because it's a difficult one for him to answer, but instead of rattling off some bureaucratic formality to humor me, he chose rather to not answer. For that, I feel somewhat relieved. Even though he only said these things to be polite, I'm still glad to have some words of consolation from him. I don't know why ever I fell for Lu Tongyi. In light of the state of the current imperial court, even if that old good for not Wang Qin should someday have a clandestine love affair with the Dowager Empress, myself, and Lu Tongyi would still have no ghost of a chance of standing on the same side. The Liu's are an aristocratic family with an illustrious pedigree, their ancestor served the founding emperor as Grand Chancellor during the establishment of the dynasty. Literati official families normally fulfill that common saying, wealth never lasts more than three generations, fame never lasts more than five. But the Lu clan is ever prosperous, and every generation has produced one or two worthy officials in high standing, every last one of those serving the imperial household with unswerving devotion, every last one wearing themselves to the bone. If only one plaque labeled noble family of devotion and justice existed, 
then no doubt it hang over the gates of the Lu estate. Emperor Tang Guang's empress was the little sister of Lu Xian, Lu Tongyi's grandfather. During Emperor Tang Guang's reign my father was still a young man, when my father first started heading off to his first campaigns on the battlefield, Imperial Uncle Kum Chief Censor Lu Xian petitioned Emperor Tang Guang time and time again, saying that for the best interest of the throne as well as the heir apparent's future, he mustn't give an imperial prince too much military power. He strongly recommended that Emperor Tong Guang consider keeping my father a jobless layabout. Good thing Emperor Tong Guang ignored him, but after that, Lu Xian could certainly take credit for why Emperor Tong Guang's son, the former emperor, guarded against my father the way one would guard oneself against thieves. Lu Tongyi's father should have had a bright future ahead of him as well. Alas, fate had other ideas, he had just been promoted to the post of Zhangdong Prefect, fourth rank, when he was cut down in his prime after contracting a lung ailment while managing a flood. Compared to Kijhe, Kitten, Kilai, and Yun Yu, Lu Tongyi is a few years older. The Lu estate has never had any dealings at all with the Prince Huai estate, and he only returned to the capital after his father passed away, so I didn't really know him as a child. The first time I saw him was probably at the palace. I think it was during the mid-autumn festival. The former emperor was already quite ill, but as always he pulled himself together to hold a moon viewing banquet in the palace gardens, inviting all of the major figures in government as well as their children. Lucien was nearly fourscore by then, his hair and beard gone all white, but even he tottered his way to the banquet. As the brightest of the moral purity faction, seated at the banquet, he resembled the bright moon above, all those holier than thou self-proclaimed virtuous so-called devoted officials such as my later father-in-law Li Yu and loyal generals gathered around him like stars. Naturally, this prince couldn't take part. I could only sit among another group with the other princes, or with Yun Teng and Wang Qin, but I was still regarded as young then, and didn't have anything to talk to them about. Unbearably bored, I went for a stroll among the flowering shrubs in the gardens after a few cups of wine, on the pretext of going to the bathroom. Kitten, Kilai, and the others were running all over the garden, playing, with the palace maids and court eunuchs running circles after them. I stood there and watched for a while, then I paused by the palace pond in search of quietude. I had nothing but the night breeze and bright moon for company, surrounded by the scent of sweet Osman thus, and floating on the water were all the stars that hung in the heavens. In the breeze, fragrance mingled with the mist and seeped into my consciousness. I felt as though my heart had become just like the water, purified. I stood there for a while, and as I was about to head back, I noticed a young man seated by the edge of the pond, on the steps at the end of the gallery. Back then, my sleeve wasn't yet cut. But in the midst of such scenery, in the light of such a moon, with such a breeze, such water, and such a fragrance in the air, suddenly seeing such a graceful and beautiful young man, I thought the sweet Osman thus tree had cultivated its essence and gained human form. But this was only a momentary confusion, another look told me that this wasn't the case. The young man looked to be fifteen, maybe sixteen, he was clad in a seemingly simple summer garment that belied its extraordinary make, obvious at a glance. He leaned back on a pillar of the gallery, sitting on the steps, and by the light of a lantern hanging above, he was reading a book. I wondered which family's child he was, why would someone entering the palace to attend an imperial banquet bring a book and hide here to read it? If I had to guess, then either this young man really did love books more than life itself, or he's doing this deliberately under instruction from his elders, waiting here for someone to spot him, better yet for his majesty to spot him. Then his majesty would ask, which family's young man is being so diligent? It would be a good start to one's reputation and a future in the bureaucracy. The young man didn't notice me, holding the book up with both hands, he seemed rather absorbed in reading it didn't look much like painstaking affectation. I waited, then walked toward him. Are you not worried that reading with such dim light may hurt your eyes? The young man seemed startled, he raised his head, 
hastily snapped the book shut and moved to stand. I gave him a smile and took another two steps forward. His expression gradually calmed. He bowed. Greetings, your highness. Presumably we'd met at the banquet earlier, but I wasn't really paying attention. No need to be so formal just speak as you would. Which family do you belong to, and why are you hiding here to read? My name is Lu Tong Yi. My grandfather is Lu Xian. Ah, so he's Lu Xian's grandchild. That explained why he'd hid himself in some out-of-the-way place to read. He stood poised and composed, his features suffused with a sedate manner that came from having been raised in a pile of classic of poetry, as befitting of a child of the Lu clan. He really was pretty, right now. But perhaps in ten years or so, there'd be another young Lucien in the imperial court. I sighed inwardly with some regret for this young man the way he was now. I studied him carefully, my gaze sweeping from his face to the book he was holding, only to discover that although he was standing there quite composed and with decorum, his sleeve was shifting slightly. Without batting an eyelid, he was hiding the book he was reading inside his sleeve. Feigning indifference, I asked, what is the book you were reading just now? Lu Tongyi looked a bit ill at ease, but seemingly still rather composed, he replied, oh, it's an ordinary book. Can you let me see it? Well, it's just an ordinary copy of Mencius, I'm sure your highness must have already read it. Lu Tongyi's gaze flickered as he told me this, like the rippling reflection of the moon on a pond. I glanced at the corner of blue peeking out of his sleeve. Is that so? Stepping closer still, and grabbing hold of the sleeve he was using to hide the book, I bent down to smilingly meet his gaze. You mustn't have done much reading in secret. Who'd stuff a book up his sleeve without checking whether it's upside down or not? I've already seen the title. Lifting up his arm, I extracted the book from his sleeve. Four words were clearly written in large print on the book jacket, Epic of Red Beard a heroic saga that was once quite popular with the bookshops. Lucien's grandson was reading this. I gave him a flabbergasted look, you're really a Lu, and not a Wang or a Yun. The children of the Wang and Yun families were all precocious, they wouldn't even blink while lying and telling an adult they were someone else when caught doing anything bad. He gave me a somewhat puzzled stare, his eyes like the surface of the pond all filled up with stars, exceptionally clear. I rolled up the book and told him conscientiously, Epic of Red Beard is a derivative work, derived from Sword of White Jade. It's not as well written as Sword of White Jade, not to mention that this copy of yours has been abridged in transcription. It's not the full version. Oh, he exclaimed. But in my opinion this one is already quite excellent. The vocabulary choices may be blunt, but very attentive to detail. At first glance the verses may seem crude, but in close examination they feel uniquely appropriate. Watching him speak about this with dead earnestness, I couldn't help finding it funny. It probably wasn't a lie he really was Lucien's grandson. That's because you haven't read any good books. This Windy Lodge is only considered average in the gamut of epic writers. His prose was all written by imitating autumnal hills who wrote Sword of White Jade. And for instance, such writers as the Mad Drunkard and Bai Yi, now those are masters of the genre. Lu Tong Yi listened to all this, eyes shining and raptly fascinated. You can easily find them if you sneak out to a bookstore in the southwest corner of the capital, there's a small bookshop in Copper Cash Lane that has pretty much everything. You can still buy the unabridged version there. Now Lu Tong Yi's eyes shone brighter than ever, looking at them, I could not refrain from adding, however, you, should get the abridged version. The unabridged version is likely inappropriate for you. These fantasy epics often depicted acts of passion between martial artists and various women, the so-called abridged versions would be those copies with such scenes removed. I'd definitely never read those, but perhaps this grandson of Lucien's wouldn't be able to take an unabridged epic. Lu Tongyi's brows furrowed slightly. Why is that? I had little choice but to vaguely suggest, the unabridged version touches upon that which happens between couples, 
and the depictions are somewhat explicit. Lu Tongyi began, how, and I surmised he was about to ask how was it explicit, but he got it as soon as the word how left his mouth, and the rest of his sentence faded away into silence. In the moonlight, beneath a dim lantern, his cheeks seemed flushed to me. I couldn't help laughing out loud then. See? I think you're better off with the abridged version. Lu Tongyi glared at me without a word, the color in his cheeks seemingly deepening. As I was laughing, I heard footsteps approaching from some distance away. I gave the book back to him at once. Someone's coming. Make sure you hide the book well. Never hide it beneath your bedding when you're reading at home too easily found out by the servants when they make the bed. The best way is to hide it underneath the bed board. Leaning closer, I lowered my voice. I was beaten as a child for not hiding my books well. This is advice based on bitter experience. Lu Tongyi was listening to me intently, unblinking, a giggle erupted from him when I told him this. The footsteps came closer and closer, seemed someone was calling for me. Prince Huai? Prince Huai, are you over there? His Majesty is asking for you. I hurriedly said my goodbyes. Lu Tongyi hid the book. By the time I turned the corner on the footpath, he had already left, gone along the winding corridor. I haven't seen him much since then, the Lu family prefers keeping to themselves, and I did not hear anything about him afterwards. Gradually, I'd nearly forgotten the entire thing. That is, until a few years later. It wasn't long after Kijhi's first independent court session. That year, after the civil examinations, Lu Tongyi was chosen as the principal graduate and became a capital household name overnight. Only then did I think of him again. I was invited to attend the Jade Forest Banquet 9 held to honor the top three imperial examines. As usual, this banquet was set up in the palace gardens, it was right by the side of the pond. By the time I arrived, the examines and those officials invited had already arrived. The only one still missing was His Majesty. I entered the garden, and spotted the vibrant red robes of the principal graduate standing among the peonies. The particulars of our meeting that one mid-autumn festival were once again fresh in my mind, I wonder just how the young man who read casual books in secret had changed. Back then he really was incomparably beautiful, but some people were only good-looking in childhood, and once they'd grown and gradually matured, they would develop in an unfathomably ugly direction. He'd better not have grown into a sans beard sans wrinkles sans white hair Lucien. I was planning to seize a free moment after I met him face to face again to ask him, did you end up reading Sword of White Jade? And did you read the abridged or the unabridged version? The vibrant red robe had its back to me, talking to the second and third rank examines in a circle with some old officials. The secretariat director, who was facing the path, was the first to spot me, smiling all at once. Oh, Prince Hawaii is here. Greetings, Your Highness. I kept walking forward while telling them to dispense with the formalities. Others turned to me in succession, and that red robe turned around too as I looked on. In a single turn, the night colors clinging to the young man who'd reflected moonlight and held a pond full of silver stars faded wholly as if touched by dawn, he was morning sun radiant, sweet Osman thus lingering as it faded, Polonia leaves turning green as jade, and crepe myrtle blooming in profusion. End Chapter Imperial Uncle Chapter 12 Lu Tongyi raised his sleeves, lowered his head. Greetings, Your Highness. I heard my own voice say, you may dispense with the formalities, Principal Graduate Lu. And it was in that very instant that the playful words I'd planned to say to him were locked behind my lips forever. People are just like that, passing strange, I've been regarded by everyone as a villain, feeling perpetually falsely accused, always believing myself both a devoted subject and a good person. But in the moment I saw Lu Tongyi, I realized immediately that he and I were destined to be different kinds of people. It was as though a clear, plain line had been drawn right there before my eyes he stood on one side, 
in the waters of a lake that couldn't be more clear beneath bright sunlight, I stood on its other side, in a pot of murky noodle broth. Everywhere, there are shadows in the light, there is light within shadows, but nothing is as pure blue as the patch of sky hanging above his head. Yun Tang said to me, quietly, in a few years he'll be another Lucien. Perhaps, I answered. More likely, he will be superior to Lucien. At the very least he definitely wouldn't have Lucien's face. Then just over a year ago, newly bestowed possession of the Chancellor's seal, Lu Tongyi stood in court assembly in his courtly blue. Never had anyone taken the post of Grand Chancellor before reaching the age of 30, in 200 years, he's the youngest person to ever stand in that spot clad in those robes. Yun Tang said to me, Your Highness's judgment of people is accurate indeed. It suffices, I replied modestly. That one copy of Epic of Red Beard, read by a winding gallery in a palace garden, beneath an ornamental lantern I wonder which corner it's been shuffled into beneath piles of sages' essays and state management strategies. It's possible too that it has long since turned into a handful of ash, been brushed away, dusted away. But in that same palace garden during the Qianlin banquet, and in the main palace hall the first time he stood serenely in his chancellor's robes, I took a few wisps of my soul and affixed them to his sleeve. Like a donkey led by the nose, knowing full well that walking around and around in circles is a foolish thing to do, still cannot help itself, cannot help but keep going. The ancients once held true that when one's suffering for love has reached a certain state, one could become a sage. I wonder whether the situation that I am in now makes me a minor sage or a great sage. I steal another glance at the Lu Tongyi walking beside me. If he would often dress in more vibrant colors like Yun Yu, his appearance would be improved, and with his hair half down he would look even better. If in the future I really could accomplish some feat of loyalty great enough to move heaven and earth to tears, maybe that line could disappear, if by then I ask him to walk with me, side by side, would he want to? Though I can't stop thinking about Lu Tongyi, I've never thought of us actually doing this or that at most I merely imagined that which I just mentioned above coming true, nothing more. And perhaps we could also play a game of go once in a while, have a conversation, share a pot of tea together and so on. It's enough. Touched by the state of suffering I have reached, I turn my gaze once more ruefully at the setting sun. A resentful voice close to me feebly says, Imperial Uncle. At once, my soul rushes back inside its mortal shell from its sojourn by the sunset. I turn my head to find Kitten's resentful face right there. Astonished, I ask, how did you appear this suddenly? Kitten stares at me, his gaze full of pathos. Imperial uncle, this prince followed you such a long way, called you so many times, and you didn't even look at me. Oh, um. I was lost in thought so I wasn't paying attention. My mind was seriously wandering just now. I wonder if I forgot my manners in front of Lu Tongyi. Seemingly by chance, I let my gaze sweep over Lu Tongyi once more. Luckily, his expression seems normal, with a little hint of a smile held in his lips. He probably didn't notice anything. As I'm about to speak again, a leisurely voice says from behind me, Prince Dai, this official was right, wasn't he? This official told you that Prince Hui's mind is certain to wander until we reach the gates of the Imperial City. You lost the bet. The speaker reaches Kitten's side. I ask, Chief Yun, what are you doing with Kitten? Yun Yu gives me a quick smile. Kitten hastens to speak before he does, while I was chasing after you and Chancellor Lu, I happened to run into Chief Yun. Don't misunderstand. What does this don't misunderstand mean exactly? Yun Yu smiles. It seems your highness and Chancellor Lu have run into each other again. Oh, that's right. It is also a coincidence. A coincidence, that's all, I reply. Lu Tongyi stops walking. Prince Hui, it looks like Prince Dai has something important he'd like to speak to your highness about. This official should be going. Please stay, I ask. Chancellor Lu, please stay, 
Kitten also asks. Yun Yu stands to one side, watching us. Lu Tongyi says, Do you need something from me, your highnesses? Oh, this prince don't need anything, but Prince Dai may not be here merely to see me, perhaps he has something to speak with you about, and that's why he asked you to stay for now. Yun Yu interjects, Yes, as Prince Huai spoke up in a bid to keep Chancellor Lu just before Prince Dai could ask him to stay, it looks like Prince Dai indeed has something important to speak to Chancellor Lu about. Seems Yun Yu's trying to outcompete my nephew Kit and today what they're saying is each less coherent than the last. Good thing Lu Tongyi doesn't look like he seems to mind whatever was said between the lines. Kitten duly adds, it's like this day before yesterday, thanks to your and uncle's help in identifying an inauthentic piece of antique, this prince was saved from a huge pointless expense. This prince have prepared a banquet in my home, and must insist that you and imperial uncle do the honors of gracing me with your presence this evening. Kitten, my boy. I did not dote on him his whole life in vain, he's more and more capable these days. Lu Tongyi accepts the invitation rather smoothly without much demur, I have no reason at all to decline. Looks like this official is the one who has no business here. I should be going. Yun Yu makes to turn as if about to go. Thereupon Kitten adds, this prince would like you to honor me with your presence as well, Chief Yun. This prince lost a bet earlier, so he ought to treat you to dinner. He turns to me and asked. Imperial uncle, isn't that so? Why is Kitten speaking in such an odd way today? I have no choice but to nod. That is so, that is so. It's a matter of course. Yun Yu looks at Kitten, then looks at me. Well then this official shall take your invitation seriously. Your highness have better not be hiding your good wine. Kitten immediately breaks into a smile. Of course. If I had the audacity to hide it, Imperial Uncle surely wouldn't let me. As we're coming upon the gates of the Imperial City, Kitten suddenly grabs my sleeve and drags me a few steps back. Revealing a rather suggestive smile, he leans close and quietly says in my ear, Chief Yun and I followed you for ages. We saw that the whole time you were engrossed with walking close to Chancellor Lu. When we're having dinner later, let me deal with Chancellor Lu. Feel free to speak only with Chief Yun. End chapter.